Dear Mother and Father, our state is to build a new state capital this year. There are to be four entrances to the building, north, south, east, and west, main building wings, and large dome and plan similar to the U.S. Capitol at Washington. The engines to warm the building are to be placed under the stone steps of the main entrances, so if they burst, the steps go up and not the building. It is to be built of stone and iron. Main floors are of marble. October 2nd, 1873, dawned bright and promising. The crisp fall air was alive with excitement. For days, wagons and trains poured into Lansing, bringing more than 30,000 people from all over Michigan to watch the installation of a granite cornerstone for their new capital. For the ceremony, Capitol Square was draped with flags and garlands hung from construction derricks jutting above the crowd. Governors, lawmakers, judges, mayors, state officials, militia, and fraternal orders paraded toward the square, marching in step with the bands. What were they celebrating? The construction of Michigan's third Capitol building, of course. But the crowd had come to Lansing that day to celebrate much more. We come here today to lay broad and deep the foundations of a Capitol worthy of our state, worthy of ourselves. Here let it rise and let it stand as a symbol of the citizens' triumphs and the state's progress. Our first capital served Michigan for 10 years, beginning in 1837 when we became a state. A small brick building with a tall steeple, it was located in Detroit, Michigan's first capital city. In 1847, however, state government moved to Lansing where a temporary wooden capital was hastily built. 30 years later, it was still in use. Critics complained that both these buildings were stuffy, crowded, uncomfortable, and dangerous fire traps. In 1871, Governor Baldwin pleaded for a new building. He warned that a fire in the wooden capital might result in the loss of public records, perhaps even the state library. Act now to prevent this disaster, for it will take years to complete a building large enough for our present and future needs. In response, the Board of State Building Commissioners announced a special competition. They invited architects from all over the country to submit designs for a new Michigan capital. This capital would be large and grand and built to last the centuries. It must also be fireproof. The disastrous 1871 Chicago fire demonstrated how important that was. Some Chicago architects lost their drawings in the blaze, so the deadline for the competition was extended. But by the end of the year, more than 20 entries had been submitted. Most of the designs were far too grand. After all, there was a strict budget to consider, but one in particular caught the commissioner's attention. Simple but elegant, it promised to deliver what they asked for, a grand monument, but not an expensive one. The winning plan bore Michigan's motto, to abor, meaning I will defend. It was the work of an enterprising young carpenter turned architect from Springfield, Illinois, Elijah E. Myers. Myers knew his career depended on the success of this building and threw himself into completing the drawings for the new capital. March 8, 1872. Honorable H.P. Baldwin, Detroit, Michigan. Honorable Sir, I have all the drawings finished except the perspective, which will require about five days yet to finish in coloring. I will be able to forward the drawings to you at Lansing Tuesday evening. Although I have worked at nights late to complete the work, I think I will not be able to get through before the time stated. Very respectfully yours, E. E. Myers. As the cornerstone was finally set in place, however, the crowd knew it was celebrating far more than the construction of a new capital, no matter how beautiful. Speakers told of the struggle to carve a new state from the wilderness. They told of the achievements and progress of the people of Michigan. 
The new capital was their monument. It had become a proud symbol of their faith in Michigan's future. The building rose, floor by floor, until the dome with its delicate lantern dominated the Lansing skyline. Stone cutters, bricklayers, carpenters, laborers, and onlookers flocked to the city to work and to watch. It would be six years before the completion date, 1878, could be chiseled into the cornerstone. The simple elegance of Meyer's capital defined a building of beauty and character. It would be numbered among the period's Gilded Age state houses rising in the nation's heartland, a model and inspiration for other state capitals for years to come. His reputation now secure, Myers would continue to design prominent buildings for the next 45 years, including the capitals of Idaho, Texas, and Colorado. He would design more state houses than any other architect and earn the title, the greatest capital builder of the Gilded Age. Myers' two abor design was, declared former Governor Baldwin at its dedication, January 1st, 1879, an edifice every way fitting and worthy of being the capital of our growing and prosperous state for centuries to come. Certainly, the public seemed to agree. Right from the start, people flocked to visit their capital. became a showcase. Some made in Michigan products were even tested on its steps. It also became a stage for public events. Famous aviator Charles Lindbergh circled the dome, and so did the first blimp to visit Lansing. Parades and holidays, protests and rallies all had their day at the Capitol. tall, graceful dome was even used in advertising, a tribute to its symbolic power. Little more than a century after its dedication, however, hammers and saws were heard once again in the capital, as the building again attracted the attention of architects, contractors, artisans, and the public. The capital was being restored, inside and out, to prepare for another century as the seat of Michigan state government. At the same time, restoration was uncovering the almost forgotten glories of this Victorian masterpiece. But the masterpiece was nearly lost altogether. For decades, time and circumstance had taken their toll on the building. Continuous, intense service, indifferent maintenance, weathering, all had diminished it. There were other problems too. The Capitol was designed for an earlier age, an age of gas lighting, wooden sewer pipes, and speaking tubes. But that world was rapidly changing. Electricity replaced gas lighting, telephones replaced messengers and speaking tubes, and computers replaced typewriters. 
New elevators were added and modern plumbing installed. Mechanical voting boards replaced slower voice voting. Steam tunnels replaced boilers. Air conditioning replaced Meyer's ventilating system, considered state-of-the-art in its day. Copy machines were placed everywhere. Architecture and art disappeared as spaces were remodeled again and again. Tangles of pipes and wires choked the building, making it harder to take care of. And more dangerous. Fire was a constant threat to the aging capital, its visitors and occupants. Cubbyhole offices and dangerous fire escapes added to the threat. But it was not until 1951, when a fire nearly destroyed a nearby state office building, that the threat was taken seriously. At that time, the state fire marshal reiterated previous warnings. Visitors were no longer allowed to climb the steep, dangerous stairs into the dome. Crowding added to the problem. Originally, all state departments were located in the capital, but as Michigan grew, so did government. The result? Cramped quarters and an ongoing search for more space as storage cabinets and desks spilled out into the crowded hallways. By the 1960s, the Capitol had become shabby and neglected. It seemed that many no longer appreciated architecture of the Gilded Age. Shoddy, grotesque, dangerous, a detraction from the state's dynamic profile, said those who wanted a new capital for Michigan, one to represent Michigan in the atomic age, rather than the age of the horse and buggy. A new capital seemed like the most logical solution. But it wasn't so logical after all. Although architects of the new capital submitted design after design, all were rejected. People just didn't like them. Political support evaporated, and public opposition mounted as costs soared. Finally, the state's faltering economy in the early 1970s put the plan on hold. However, there was another reason for the plan's failure. The elements of Elijah Meyer's capital are familiar to all of us today. A tall central dome with soaring rotunda, balanced by wings for the House and the Senate. These elements are familiar because Meyer's Michigan design became the model for state capitals all over the country. Today, these easily recognized and uniquely American landmarks have become powerful symbols, not just of government, but of our American form of democratic government, symbols which have proven enduring. Without a new capital, however, something had to be done about the old one. Soon, a make-do solution was found. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, most of the capital's soaring 20-foot-high offices were subdivided by inserting a new floor halfway up. Called overflooring, this created two offices from one. Stairs were added and tall windows divided in half, while decorated plaster walls and ceilings disappeared behind drop ceilings and paneling. The building held more people, but much of its art and architecture was now hidden, damaged, or destroyed altogether. But although overflooring certainly diminished the capital, it also may have saved it. It made the building work for the time being, while our attitudes about history itself began to change. Several events, the Capitol's 1971 placement on the National Register of Historic Places, the nation's 1976 bicentennial, and the Capitol's 100th birthday in 1979 attracted more attention to the old building. People were beginning to view the Capitol as an irreplaceable historic treasure. And as they became more interested, they became more concerned about the crowded, overtaxed building. In 1982, concern for the deteriorating building led Governor William Milliken to appoint a committee to study its future. Reorganized later that year as the Friends of the Capitol, the nonprofit educational group urged the restoration of the Capitol and continues today to promote its preservation, not as a museum, but as a working seat of Michigan state government. This building is a tribute 
to the citizens of the state of Michigan and the history of the state itself. It is an historic building of national significance. To allow this building to deteriorate to the point that it is no longer useful would be a shameful waste. Reversing more than a century of deterioration began slowly. A pilot project to restore the lobby of the Senate chamber in 1985 became the catalyst for future restoration. Conservators restored painted walls and intricate designs obscured by age and overpainting and searched for furnishings appropriate to the 1880s. In the corridors, the distinctive cast metal Michigan chandeliers, complete with elk from the state's coat of arms, were restored. Ironically, the chandeliers, long believed to be made of Michigan copper, proved to contain steel, lead, iron, zinc, and brass, but no copper. Enthusiasm grew, spurred by Michigan's 150th birthday. The House and Senate tackled a new project on the fourth floor, where a maze of offices was transformed into rooms for committee sessions, public meetings, and hearings. Overfloors were removed, skylights uncovered, and walls painted with authentic colors and designs. The chandeliers, the fourth floor, and the Senate lobby now contrasted so dramatically with their drab surroundings that they provided a tantalizing glimpse of what the building might become if fully restored. People were beginning to see the building in a new light as a legacy handed down through generations, a tangible link to the past. In 1987, a team of experts in all fields of historic preservation was assembled. Their research was reported in a preservation master plan, which became the blueprint for restoration. To oversee the restoration, the Michigan Capital Committee was formed. The committee is bipartisan, and its members represent the building's occupants, the Senate, House, and the Governor's Office. Finally, in early 1989, after years of research and preparation, the restoration was underway on a scale as grand as the Capitol itself. The committee decided to keep the Capitol open throughout the project. Architects, carpenters, painters, plumbers, artisans, engineers, metal workers, stonemasons, and all the other members of the restoration team had to work around lawmakers, lobbyists, office staff, and thousands of visitors. It made the restoration more challenging, but also more rewarding. It allowed people to see just how their building was being restored and why. It showed that irreplaceable treasures like the Capitol can be recycled and renewed without sacrificing the very qualities which make them unique. And it served as an inspiration to others struggling to preserve Michigan's heritage. In the 1880s, the Capitol's plain plaster and pine interior was transformed by artisans who used skillfully applied paint to create an illusion of expensive walnut, rare marble, and opulent walls and ceilings. Almost every painting technique of the Victorian period, stenciled and freehand designs, striping, gilding, glazing, wood graining, and marbling, was used to create richness and beauty at a fraction of the cost of real marble and walnut. Over the years, most of this distinctive work was covered up, painted over, and forgotten. Paint restoration experts rediscovered these original colors and patterns hidden beneath layers of overpaint and wall coverings. Interestingly, in the hundreds of rooms in the Capitol, almost no two had been painted alike. Decorative painters worked day and night to restore over nine acres of hand-painted walls, ceilings, and wood trim. Wood grainers skillfully employed their ancient craft to recreate the appearance of walnut on miles and miles of pine wainscot and hundreds of pine windows and doors. Using special brushes and techniques, layers of paint were applied so convincingly that most visitors today find it hard to believe that the results are not real walnut. Workers also removed over 40,000 square feet of overfloors, stifling the building. Dramatic 20-foot high ceilings were restored, and original painted designs and colors were returned to walls and ceilings. 
period furnishings, carpeting, and lighting, while accurately recreating the original appearance of these rooms, were chosen for function, for these would be working offices, not museum displays. Plasterers working on scaffolding high above the floor repaired or replaced original plaster ceilings. Weakened by age and overflooring, the ceilings threatened to collapse. Plasterers also repaired elaborate cornices damaged by earlier remodeling, creating their own templates to carefully match the originals. Changes wrought by such artisans were dramatic, but other changes, just as important, go largely unnoticed by visitors today. Aging and dangerous wiring, leaking plumbing, overtaxed heating and cooling systems were modernized. Modern safety systems were installed, including two enclosed interior fire stairs. Ramps and automatic doors, lowered drinking fountains, and barrier-free restrooms have made it possible for all Michigan citizens to visit their capital. For while the goal of the restoration was to restore the building as accurately as possible to the 19th century, it was also being prepared for the 21st. It would echo the past, but work in the future. To continue as the seat of Michigan state government, it must be safe, accessible, efficient, and comfortable. The first completed segments of the restoration were the ornate Senate and House chambers and their public galleries. Here, the results were among the most dramatic in the Capitol. Ceilings of glass panels etched with state coats of arms and Victorian designs illuminate legislative sessions once again. The original panels were discarded or lost, so reproductions featuring all 50 states have taken their place. Original chandeliers were restored and others reproduced from historic photographs. Rostrums and legislators' desks, designed by architect Myers, were refinished. Portraits returned to their historic places and voting boards hidden behind tinted acrylic covers. Chamber carpets feature designs of the Victorian period. Underneath, the floors were slightly raised to allow space for modern utilities like electrical cabling. This ingenious innovation solved the problem of how to hide modern technology in an 1879 building while still being accessible and providing space for future needs. Brilliant colors are complemented by brighter lighting, which once more sparkles from both chambers. While the chambers are architecturally almost identical, it is color which renders each unique. The Senate shimmering in blues and silvers, the house glowing with terracotta and teal. Galleries have also regained their original appearance and during sessions are packed with visitors following debate on the chamber floors below. Techniques which proved so successful in the chambers were repeated throughout the Capitol. 150 feet of scaffolding rose in the towering rotunda to allow decorative painters, conservators, and other workers to reach dizzying heights. In the historic office and parlor of Michigan's governors, partitions were removed, surfaces restored, and original furnishings made just for these rooms returned to their rightful places. The elegant former Supreme Court chamber was adapted for a new use as a hearing and meeting room showing how original spaces can be recycled without sacrificing history. Outside, scaffolding rose to the tip of the Capitol's landmark dome, a never-to-be-forgotten sight. Soon workers were stripping layers of paint in preparation for a new coat. For the first time in years, the dome was painted as architect Myers intended, not white, but a warm tone which matches the Capitol's fine Ohio sandstone exterior. The stone itself was cleaned and repaired where years of weather and salt had damaged it. And the Capitol finally got its copper roof. Myers had originally called for one, but it was declared too expensive. It would prove a costly decision. The substitute tin roof leaked from the start and required constant repair. Even the grounds are being gradually restored so that trees replanted around the perimeter of Capitol Square will once again form a leafy walkway and frame for the building. The grounds were also enhanced with period lighting and Victorian flower beds, while monuments were conserved 
and the nation's largest catalpa tree protected by a decorative iron fence. The transformation continued throughout the building until it glowed with light and color from dome to foundation. The result? A building which is not only safe and efficient, but beautiful. In November of 1992, three years after it began, a gala celebration marked the successful completion of this grand and challenging restoration. The people of Michigan were invited to see the results for themselves, and thousands accepted the invitation, while the Capitol was rededicated to another 100 years of service to Michigan. A highlight of the ceremonies was the presentation of two very special awards. The National Trust for Historic Preservation chose the Capitol's restoration over hundreds of other projects, honoring its challenge and authenticity with the nation's highest restoration award. The Capitol was also designated a National Historic Landmark, an honor reserved only for our nation's most important historic sites. Commended as one of the finest examples of Victorian painted decorative arts in the country, the Capitol was also recognized for its role in establishing Elijah Meyer's career, its role as a model for other state capitals, and its role in establishing the dome as a symbol of American democracy. You even today, when you see kids, school kids in that rotunda and they reach down to touch the glass or they look up at the grandeur, that's what these buildings are all about. They're not for the few, they're for the many. And so it's an extremely successful building and it made E.E. E. Myers a successful man. If Myers returned today, he would find that his capital is being truly celebrated. He would appreciate the glimpse that restoration offers of a young state's struggle for progress and its pride in its past. He would applaud the renewal of the Capitol's traditional role of inspiring and reflecting Michigan's heritage and accomplishments. As the state moves into the 21st century, he would recognize that Michigan has as fitting a monument as it had hoped for on that day in October so long ago. For more information about the Capitol or tours, please call area code 517-373-2353.